Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the 2022 Southwest Believers Convention. Can we give God praise and a shout right now? Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, it's so good to have you here. We welcome all of you who are here at the Tarrant County Convention Center, and we also welcome all of those that are watching us right now from the top of the world to the bottom all the way around the middle. Would you welcome them to the Southwest Believers Convention? So glad that you're tuning in. Praise God. Well, if you would, go ahead and be seated for just a moment. Uh, Brother Copeland shared this with us last night that... Uh, Pastor Bill Winston was scheduled to be with us, but he is under assignment from the Lord. He's been given an assignment to take the Word of God to 10 cities across the United States of America and change them, transform them with the power of the Word of God. And so I want you to take a look at your screens. Pastor Bill has a special, special message for us here at the convention. So take a look. Hello, Bill Winston here. Listen, I know you're probably wondering, where is he? Well, I'm doing the Lord's work. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know, I've been at uh, Believers of Southwest uh, so many years, and I'm telling you, it's just been a blessing for me. You know, uh, Brother and Sister Copeland have been really, I mean, they have men mentored me <laughs> in order, a whole lot of ways, taught me a whole lot of things, and we are in covenant for life. Praise God. Well, this year, I'm hitting the road. I, God's got some things in my heart and telling me what to do. We're going to 10 cities. We want to go to these urban communities, all this shooting and people dying and stuff. We, we don't like it. We can't, I just can't sit here anymore. I've got to go and do something for the kingdom of God. Get the kingdom into these places and kingdom rules over everything. So that's where I am. So I just want to let you know that even though I am not there, I'm there in spirit and that this is going to be the most powerful, one of the best conferences that we've ever had at Southwest. This is going to be it. Praise the Lord. Get ready. <laughs> Amen. Because they're really going to roll out some things this year. I prayed for it. I'm really believing. See, it's not the person. It's the anointing, praise God. It's the anointing that you want to look for. And all the speakers are anointed. They got Jeremy this time, praise God. Look out, here comes a freight train, praise the Lord. We thank you so much for all of that, the, the, uh, the love and kindness that you've shown us and even the caring and, and wondering, you know, and where we are and so forth. We're in good hands. We're in the hands of the Lord. And Brother Copeland and I always stay in touch and just, he just, I'm just so thankful that I, I've been mentored in a way that I can now take the training wheels off. I can go and do some things that need to be done. And, uh, and they're such a blessing to me. And, and like any way, he, he said, any way I can help you, <laughs> let me know. Because he's got resources. We always use his people to, to get our sound system right and all kinds of things. So we're all in covenant, praise God. And I'm going to send my offering in too. <laughs> Amen. But uh, just want to let you know all is well. I'm out here doing a 10 city tour. We call it Operation 10 cities. We're going in like, like the uh, Navy SEALs or something, you know. We're going to straighten some of this thing out. We're going to get this kingdom and invade darkness in Jesus' name. So pray for us. We'll be doing the same for you. By the way, my son David, he'll be right there. Pastor David, he's running this youth ministry up here and also helping us on the road. But he'll be right there with the youth as you, you're preaching, teaching, and healing in the name of Jesus. So I just want to thank you so much for all the love and kindness that you have always shown us and just let you know that Jesus is Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Everyone stand up with me, please. He just said pray for him, so we're going to pray for him right now on this assignment. Father, in the name of Jesus, we lift up 
Pastor Bill Winston, and this anointed assignment that you've given to him. And Lord, we believe that lives will be changed. Cities will be changed. The anointing of God upon him to deliver the word of faith will bring peace to those cities. And Lord, we thank you for the work that he is doing, the assignment that shall be fulfilled, and we set ourselves in agreement with him right now that it shall be done. It shall be done. Use him, protect him, protect his team. Lord, we plead the blood of Jesus over the 10 city assignment and thank you for its perfect fulfillment in the name of Jesus. Do you agree with that? Praise God. Those of you that would like to come down to the altar here and worship with us as we praise the Lord, come on, make your way down here right now and let's say this after me. In Jesus' name, we declare the glory of the Lord over this service tonight. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
Well, welcome to Jesus night. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. My firm foundation. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generation. So why? still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be
Come on, do you believe it tonight? My Lord, my Lord, Jesus. The reign of darkness now has ended in the kingdom of light, in the kingdom of light. Forever under your dominion, you're the king of my life. You're the king of my life. Come on, lift your voice. Did you reign above it all? You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart, there is no higher name. Jesus, you reign above it all. And on the cross, the work was finished. You poured out your to give us new life. Now from the lips of the forgiven, hear an anthem of rise. Cause Jesus, you're alive. Yeah, yeah. And you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and over every heart. There is Circumstance, God, you reign. As you sent the darkness run out of an empty grave, seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness run out of an empty grave, now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. Darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running out of an empty grave. Now seated alone in glory, enthroned on the highest praise. You sent the darkness running.
gentlemen, would you please join me in welcoming Brother Kenneth Copeland. Thank you, David. Come on, give the Lord a shout tonight. Glory to God. I mean, didn't we hear some word today? Uh, praise God. I, uh, you know, Jeremy said he told my favorite story about the, our, little, our little buddy. Of course, he's several years older now than he was then. And they were on a road trip and they had a potty emergency. And the only place was a roadside rest station. And he was talking about, we're different. Our children are different. And they walked in there and he said, oh, daddy, this smells like the curse of the law in here. <laughs> That's my favorite right there. Praise God. Well, let's give the Lord a praise and then Thanksgiving once again, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, uh, before you're seated, before you're seated, I want you to remain standing for a moment. Our registration report, the total registered is 4,393. Main registered, 3,584. Includes 420, 452 pastors, ministries, or churches. 1440 registered, 411. Super kids, 398. Now, everybody that's registered, be seated. If you've registered, everybody that hasn't remain standing. Ushers, would you hand them a registration card, please? <laughs> now, let me tell you something. No one, I mean no one gets your name and address. We do not do that. These ministries, all of us together, we do not swap mailing lists ever, 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 ever. And we certainly don't sell it to anybody. So you may rest assured that it's very confidential. And uh, you can see we need to continue to add to this as the day goes on. Now then, we need, we still need District of Columbia. Anybody here from, from D.C.? Get that man a card right now. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Mark that one off the list. <laughs> Hallelujah. Right up here. I need an usher here with a registration card. Okay. North Dakota. Anybody know anybody in North Dakota? <laughs> well, call them and tell them to get here. <laughs> Praise God. South Dakota. I was just up there and preached in Fargo just a few weeks ago. And Wyoming. Anyone here from Wyoming? Well, there will be because we'll get them all before it's over with. Hallelujah. And <clears throat> U.S. Uh, territories that have checked in, the AA Armed Forces Americas, North Mariana Islands, Puerto Rico, and Virgin Islands. Now, <clears throat> we're going to do this again tonight. We have 16 countries registered in, and when I call your country, please stand and remain standing. Australia, Barbados, Brazil, Canada, Hungary, Ivory Coast, Kenya, Nigeria, Peru, Russia, South Africa, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, and Zimbabwe. Glory to God. Come on, give the Lord a praise. Thank you for coming here. We want to bless you in the name of Jesus. Just thank you for coming and sharing with us. You may be seated. Praise God. All right, I have some reports here for you. <clears throat> now, we've added some countries. All 50 states and District of Columbia are watching. We now have... 92 nations, total number of households. Now remember, with the, the worldwide average now is three per household. Number of households, 
138,637 times three is 415,911 people watching this service. <laughs> Glory to God, hallelujah. Now you've heard me say this before when I was at <clears throat> Old Roberts University, I came in from school one afternoon and, <clears throat> and I just brought my briefcase in and set it down and I said, Gloria, I'm gonna go down here. The Arkansas River comes right there by Riverside Drive. I'm gonna go down there in this riverbed and uh, sometimes there's a lot of water in it, but that particular time it, it wasn't, there's a dry part of it down there. And uh, <clears throat> I just went down there <clears throat> and began to walk and pray in the spirit. And I kept hearing nations, nations, nations. I just kept hearing that, nations in my spirit, nations. And I, I kept, kept praying and, and the effect of nations. And I began to hear different nations in my spirit. Well, at that time, I knew in my heart that we were supposed to have large meetings. And I was in two of the last tent meetings that, that Oral Roberts Evangelistic Association conducted. And since I was part of their, their flight crew, then, you know, I was in all of those meetings and big auditoriums and all that. Well, I was, I was seeing eight, 10, 12,000 people at a time and uh, sometimes up to 15,000, that's huge. And uh, that's what I had in my mind. But this is what the Lord was talking about. This is it right here. Angola, Antiqua, Barbuda, Armenia, Aruba, Australia, Austria, Bahamas, Barbados, Belgium, Bermuda, Botswana, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, China, Colombia, Costa Rica, Caraco, Czech Republic, Denmark, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, Fiji, Finland, France, Germany, Ghana, Greece, Grenada, Guam, Guatemala, Gu Guyana, Honduras, Hong Kong, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, Italy. As you read this, it kind of, you know, I'm hard to keep talking in tongues, but start reading through this. <laughs> Makes me want to. Well, I always want to. Honduras, Hong Kong, Iceland, India, Indonesia, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Jamaica, Japan, Kenya, Kyrgyzstan. I tried, tried to say that three times. K Y R G Y Z S T A N. There you have it. <laughs> Latvia. Lebanon, Luxembourg, Malawi, Malaysia, Mauritius, Mexico, Myanmar, Netherlands, New Zealand, Nepal, Nigeria, Norway, Palau, Panama, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Puerto Rico, Romania, Russia, St. Lucia, Samoa, Sierra Leone, uh, St. Martin, Singapore, South Africa, South Korea, Spain, Sri Lanka, Sweden, Switzerland, Tanzania, Trinidad and Tobago, and Turkey, Turks and Chaosios Islands. Hang on. U.S. Virgin Islands, Uganda, Ukraine, United Arab Emirates, United Kingdom, Vanato, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, Zambia and Zimbabwe and the United States. Glory to God. Somebody ought to give the Lord a praise for that. So now, when we have a meeting now, what we have in this auditorium is actually a token of the size of this convention. And so it's, it's amazingly important that we, that everyone registers so that we actually know uh, how many people are actually here in the meeting. And we, then it come to the end of the week, we total it all up and everybody has, has a good time. 2022 Southwest Believers Convention Evangelism Report. This week, we have trained and ministered to 215 of our partners on the importance of evangelism. These partners represent 88 churches in 29 states and three countries. Today, we had 23 team members out ministering in Fort Worth. 
And as of this afternoon, we have reported 211 salvations, 69 Holy Spirit baptisms, and 22 healings. Our team encountered a woman in a motorized chair today, and after going through salvation prayer with her, we asked if she was having any pain. She said the worst pain was in her knee. We prayed for her to be healed, and she said the pain had gone down significantly, but it was still there. So they prayed again. Then she said, it feels like I could actually get up out of this chair and walk. We encouraged her to try. She got up and walked. Praise <laughs> God. We had the honor of hosting Dr. Jesse Duplantis as our guest speaker today. He reminded us of the importance of evangelism, that you never know who you may be speaking to. You could be sharing Jesus with one person today and that once with thousands of people later. He also taught on how necessary it is to make sure that new believers are given direction, not just salvation. It's been a powerful start to our week in evangelism to God be the glory. That, that's worthy of praise right there. I mean, this is... This is, this is something that Jesse's exactly right about this. When you're, when you're out winning souls, you re, you're, it's really the beginning of someone's future, someone's life in, in Christ Jesus. You really don't know yet who you just talked to. Amen. You know, somebody won Billy Graham. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And then Billy Graham won Jesse. And there's no telling how many people that man's brought into the kingdom of God. So that, that's the way the kingdom works. Now then, Super Kids Academy. Mm. I remember the first year, Kelly gets a kick out of this, I always tell this, that we introduced Super Kids Academy. Ordinary kids doing extraordinary things by the power of the Spirit of God. And she had a, a table in the book table area, and she had, it was cassette tapes back in those days. She had them all out there. And this little boy looked up at her, he was just a little taller than the table, and he said, Commander Kelly, I want adventure so bad. <laughs> well, he got in there and had adventure, and now, of course, he's out doing his, his own adventures now. I wish all of you adults could peek into Super Kid Academy at certain moments during our time with your kids. It seems that whenever parents are in our room, either dropping off or picking up their children, it's game time, video time, or some sort of activity. What they rarely get to see are the moments like we had last night during our service. A powerful worship service led right into our God time as we shared from God's Word how breath and all life comes from Him. The presence of the Lord was so evident and the, and the kids were locked in without any distractions. I think you, if you could see this and feel the power in the atmosphere, it would be a blessing to you. But whether you ever get to witness this or not, be assured. Your children are experiencing the greatness of God and the presence of Jesus here in Super Kid Academy. We love y'all. Asking the Lord to visit us again tonight, Commander Dana. So they're not babysitting. I'm telling you, it's powerful. 1440, 270 students in attendance. And now, um, on day one, 1440 ended on a high note as we had honor of having Dean Sykes. We most definitely had a move of God. Dean taught the students that in order to live an uncommon faith, they're going to have to deposit the Word of God into their hearts on a daily basis. The Lord moved mightily as students were saved, rededicated their lives to the Lord, delivered from suicidal thoughts and unforgiveness. The presence of the Lord was thick and tangible as Dean began to lay hands on almost every student in the room to walk in the freedom that Jesus has provided that faith in God accesses. It was amazing to see what the Lord did. It was only night one. 
it's only going to increase here. 20 first time salvations, 50 students rededicated to the, their life to the Lord, 17 students delivered from suicidal thoughts, 46 students who were called to full time ministry were prayed over, 200 plus students who were struggling with forgiveness were prayed for. Now, Tuesday, Commander Kelly, 260 students in, in attendance. Day two, do two picked up right where day one ended, and we had the one and only Commander Kelly. The students received a rich word as she taught the students a message titled, When Are We? The students listened with eager ears as she taught about the times they're living in and the nearness of Jesus coming. These students are living in the most crucial generation ever, and Jesus is going to be looking for faith when he returns. Commander Kelly encouraged them to always keep their eyes on Jesus, no matter what the situation they find themselves in. And she reminded the students of how their, heaven, how their heavenly Father sees them. The Lord worked with his word and confirmed it with signs and wonders and multiple students had, that had never experienced before. 200 students know they heard the voice of the Lord. Yeah. Folks, we have, a, we have a young generation that's coming up, and this is a powerful time. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Would you stand with me and let's just give the Lord praise and thanksgiving for these reports? I'm, I'm telling you, this is outstanding. I, I, was, I, I was so impressed this afternoon with what Keith Moore said. And, and what Jeremy was talking about, I mean, look at us. Uh, and Jesse brought it up, Jerry brought it up. Look, I mean, look, yeah, we're different. And there are, there are people having meetings and conventions everywhere, but where do you know where, they, where people come in and spend a whole week in 105 degree weather <laughs> to worship God and hear the word of faith preached? and grow in powerful ministry and word. And by the end of the week, your entire life and future is changed. Amen. Glory to God. Ministries leave with direction. Came in searching, leave with direction. And people leave with answers to the questions and to the problems. Glory to God. So just lift your hands and give the Lord praise and honor and glory. Amen. And while you're standing, put your hands together and welcome Creflo Dollar to this platform. Yes, amen. Sir. The man himself. <laughs> Sir. Oh, yeah. Sir. Yes, sir. You know, I, I was thinking, you, you can sit down. I'm going to talk to him a little bit. Um, he and I were talking on the phone the other day, and, and <laughs> I don't remember really what, what brought this about, but Gloria and I were staying in their home, and it was cold in Atlanta, and it got icy and snowy, and somehow, Gloria and Taffy decided to go house looking. Yeah. And we just went slipping and sliding around. Yeah. We did. <laughs> and he, he had a, a Jeep Wagoneer, I think it was. Yeah. Real nice, brand new. Yeah. Had four wheel drive. Yeah. And so he said, you drive this. I said, okay. So we're driving around. You know, I got to thinking about what else happened that day. He and I were driving along there and the, the prophet's anointing came on me and I just began to speak in the spirit. And this was the first time that this, this had ever happened to me just like this. I turned around to him and I said, you know, I believe I received that. When Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive, he didn't say it as long as you can understand what you said. That's prayer, isn't it? Yeah, that's it. 
can you do that? <laughs> That's what he said, can you do that? I said, well, yeah, let's do it. So we just started, and the anointing of God came on the two of us, and we began to have a conversation in tongues. And it went back and forth, and then one would interpret back to the other. It was one of the most amazing experiences I've ever had, and it's the only time I ever experienced that. Wow. But that day, I learned to believe I receive when I'm praying in the Spirit, particularly specifically about certain things. And it changed my prayer life. Yeah. And you caused that. <laughs> praying mysteries. Praying mysteries and secrets. Well, that's, yeah, that's what the Lord said. Yeah. I, 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 it just came out of my mouth. I said, you know, that's my mystery. <laughs> that's my divine secret. Mm -hmm. And I believe I received it. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Who said you had to understand it in order to receive that's it? Right. How long have we been together? Mm. Oh, I was, I used to be 24. <laughs> that, that's how long. <laughs> yes, sir. A lot of, 30, lot of, 30, lot of 30, 30 years. I remember I was in the back bedroom there preparing to preach. And I just, I had just, just got dressed and I just, just finished tying my tie. And your baby walked in there. I didn't know she was in there. She walked in there and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I'm getting ready to preach. Really? I said, yes. And she said, what else are you doing? I said, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you I love you. Really? <laughs> she stood there. We visited for a good little bit. And of course now, I mean, you know, yeah. she's grown and a woman. Yeah, praise God. Yes, sir. Father, I pray for this man of God tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the anointing and the, the spirit of power that dwells in him and on him. Yes, we receive his gift. We receive his anointing tonight. Thank you. And we make room for it. Thank you, Jesus. We make room for his office. Thank you, Jesus. We make room for what you have to say to us through this vessel. We thank you for him. We praise you for him. Where's Taffy? She's right here. Huh? She's she not out here? Yes, she's right here. She behind There she is. No, oh. there she is. Oh, there she go right there. Stand up, beautiful. I never been to keep her word. There she is, right there. And, uh, you know, that, that's what makes Crest Roll run. Yep. <laughs> yes, sir. I love you, brother. I love you, too. Thank you for liberty. Thank you. Thank you. Before we get into the message tonight, I have the honor and the privilege of receiving the offering tonight. Amen. And uh, <laughs> if you would go with me to the book of Philippians, chapter 4, and verse 19, a very familiar scripture here. Philippians, chapter 4, 19, but I want to bring something to your thinking. Verse 19 says, and this same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. This same God that takes care of me. When you give tonight, I want you to understand that your giving is a response to God's ability to take care of you. You're giving, responding to God because you know he can take care of you. Now, if you have a hard time giving, it's because you don't really believe that God can take care of you. But he is committed to our care. He is committed to take care of us. And when I give, I am declaring my dependence on a God that I know can take care of me. When you begin to look at all the things that are going on in the world today, you begin to check out, you know, the, the talks of uh, recession and what's going to happen to Dow Jones. And I got to thinking about this. A lot of folks don't know nothing about no Dow Jones. They're just trying to get enough money to put gas in the tank and all that. But when you begin to understand that, 
you begin to know that God takes care of me, therefore I am not afraid to give. I don't fear giving when I know that God has committed himself to my care. And that blows my mind that he is committed to my care. And not, not just in this area, but in every area of your life, God has made a commitment to take care of you. So the next time you're staring a bill in, uh, in, in your, a bill is staring you in the face or a need is staring you in the face, you just need to look up and say, God, thank you that you are committed to take care of me. Now, how does that get, how does that get to rolling? Look, look over here in um, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and Paul uses the analogy of farming to describe how this works. Remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And so a couple of things here. You get to decide how much to give and you also get to decide how much harvest you're going to get. Because he tells you now, if you sow sparingly, then that's what's going to come back. But if you sow generously, he said, then you will receive generously. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And he says, and don't give reluctantly. Want to do it. Don't give reluctantly. Nobody should have to twist your arm to do it. God should have done, you should have enough testimony in your life to look over your life and see the number of times that God has shown up to take care of you. When everything else was failing, God was taking care of you. When things were not available, he was taking care of you. And as you begin to look at that, you decide in your heart how much to give. And he says, don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. He says, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always, you will always have everything you need. And watch this, and plenty left over to share with others. So you're going to have what you need and plenty left over to share with others. When was the last time you shared with others? We're in a society right now where people are really self-centered and they think about themselves. But when you begin to look at, you know what, God has met my needs and I've got plenty left over. Lord, show me who I can share with. I remember years ago, I'm not too sure when it was, but Brother Jerry began to, he taught a message and he defined the word blessing. And um, when he defined that word blessing, I never forget, I saw a water hose attached to the spigot and you were just a instrument by which God would flow favor through you to get to somebody else. You know, some people won't get it unless you are willing to allow God to use you to flow favor through your life into somebody else's life. And I'm telling you, there's no better thing that can happen when you see somebody on the other end of favor that has come from you. I mean, they begin to give thanks to God. They begin to praise God. It'll change their life because, you know, they thought, well, God, God won't do anything for me because I'm not good enough or, you know, I fall short in a lot of areas. And then God turns around and he uses you to begin to show favor. Let's recognize that God will do what he said. He'll meet my needs and he will have plenty left over for me to share and meet somebody else's need. I tell you what, when you are ready to be a blessing, God will accept the responsibility to make sure you're blessed. Amen. Amen. So as you, as you give tonight, I want, I want you to give knowing that he is able to take care of his promise. You know, if you sow a seed of any amount, God is committed to multiplying that. So as you sow and as you give in this meeting all week long, please understand that God is committed to your care. He will take care of you. You don't have to be afraid or fear where your giving is concerned. He will bring his promises to pass. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and prepare for our giving. Kurt is going to come up and tell you exactly how to do this with all this technology and buttons and stuff. And he needs to explain all that to you. I'll be back to preach in a minute. <laughs>
Praise the Lord. If you'd like an offering envelope here in the sanctuary, just simply raise your hand and an usher will get one of those to you. Thank you again so much for your giving and your faithfulness over these last few days. And for those of you that are watching right now, literally from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around the middle, you can be a part of this offering as well. For those of you watching online on the KCM or the Victory Channel websites, go to kcm.org forward slash TV event and you can give. For all of you on social media on KCM and the Victory Channel, right in the right hand corner there is a link right there. You can click and you can be a part of this as well. And then for text to give here in the sanctuary, there's information up on the screens. Text to give. It's safe, secure, and easy. Text event, E-V-E-N-T, to 36609. Some of you are looking like, how does that work? And so it's real easy. It's real simple. And also you can call one of our licensed prayer ministers at 877-281-6297. If you'd like to stick your offering in the mail, you can do so at Kenneth Copeland Ministries or KCM, Fort Worth, Texas, 76192. And again, all the information is on the screen as we worship the Lord here. And ushers, when the people are ready to give, feel free to pass the offering buckets. But we have a treat here tonight, none other. And you know him, you love him. Come on, put your hands together for Ray Jean Wilson. He's gone on the platform.
Father, we thank you for this another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind. None of me and all of you. And Father, I thank you that every ear is anointed to hear. Every heart is anointed to receive. And Lord, I pray by the Holy Ghost, you will do something so magnificent in the lives of these, your children, that no man will dare take the credit or boast about what you have done. And so we praise you in advance of it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a big hand clap of praise before you're seated. I said, come on, let's give the Lord a big hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Titus, chapter 2. Titus, chapter 2. And when you get to Titus, chapter 2, let's begin at verse 11. I want to establish some things for the series I'm going to deal with this week and tell you in a moment what we're going to be talking about. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. And while we're doing that, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me say that uh, Jesus is on his way back. And while the news is talking to you about global warming, please understand it is a global warning. Things are about to happen. Amen? Now, notice in verse 11, he says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. This grace has appeared to all men giving them the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of their lives. Grace of God is made available. This, this has been made available and appeared to all men. So everybody on the planet has the opportunity to get born again if they want to. Now, we know everybody on the planet, uh, a lot of folks have not taken that opportunity, but thank God for those who have taken that opportunity. But the grace of God bring salvation and has appeared to all men. Now notice this, verse 12, teaching us. And so those of us who have received uh, salvation and we have taken advantage of this grace that's been made available to all men, grace is now teaching us, teaching us that denying ungodliness, teaching us to deny worldly lust that we should live, teaching us to live soberly, teaching us to live righteously, and teaching us to live godly in this present world. So, you know, sometimes people say, well, you better be careful about that grace, man. You get in it too much, it'll cause you to have loose living. No, this grace will teach you Christian conduct like nothing else. This grace will teach you how to refuse and to deny ungodliness, but it'll also teach you how to be godly. In fact, I looked at that one day because I wanted to make sure I was getting everything I needed to get out of this. This issue when he says grace will talk, will teach us to, to deny or to refuse ungodliness. You know, ungodliness is defined as not having regard for God. When you're ungodly, we, we're not saying that uh, it doesn't mean that wickedness is there, but it's not just being wicked. It's not just being 
remorseful or immoral. It's not just being deprived. It's not just being dishonorable. It's not just being um, all of those things that would be under the category of wickedness. All those things are true, but it also at the very root means to, to live a life with no regard for God. It includes all that is done without taking God into account. The grace of God will teach you to, re, to refuse and to deny ungodliness. In other words, to deny uh, disregarding God. Everything that we cannot ask God to bless is ungodly. When things happen in your life and you see no need to get God to bless it and you proceed to do things without regarding God. Now you think about that. How many things in your life are you doing and you're not even regarding God? You've decided I want to do it my way, when I want to do it, how I want to do it. And then we go and we say, God, come and bless this rather than going to God and say, Lord, show, show me what you want me to do. It is just as much ungodly act for you to walk in disregard to God. And the Bible says that grace will teach you to, to deny disregarding God, to deny uh, this, this issue of living a life where you can just kind of walk around and think, well, I don't need to get God to bless this. And I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to need God to bless a lot of things. When systems start failing, when your money starts failing, when you show up to go get your favorite Greek yogurt and it's not on the shelf, you might want to start involving God into your life before you start doing something instead of having a, an afterthought of it. But grace will begin to teach you that. Grace will also teach you how to be godly. Well, what is that? It is to have regard for God. It, 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 it includes voluntary dependence upon God. It is, it is a godly life, a godly life that is free from doubt. It's, it's a godly life that is free uh, from doubting his wisdom, doubting his love, doubting his goodness, doubting his provision. It is a godly life where you're saying, God, I, know to, I not only regard you, but I absolutely depend on you. I, I need you. I got to have you. I've got enough of seeing what happens when I start doing things without you. I am totally dependent upon you. I declare my dependence upon you. You are my God. You will take care of me. Any devil show up, you are used to kicking devil butt. Thank you, God, for, for taking my life and doing what you do with my life. It's dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. Dependence upon God excludes all dependence upon self. We're living in a society where we've come to depend on ourselves more than we've come to depend on God. Therefore, tonight I'd like to start, I'm not going to finish this tonight, but I want to talk about righteousness versus self-righteousness you choose. Righteousness versus self-righteousness you choose. Righteousness is so critical in our lives today that if there's one place where the enemy wants to put a constant attack on you, it is in that area of your identity where righteousness is concerned. If he can somehow interfere with your identity, he can affect your behavior. Your behavior is a result of who you are. It's a result of your identity. Get that right, then as a result of it, you will begin to, to, to fall in line and see a lot of things happen. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 and 13. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12 and 13. <clears throat> Verse 12 says this, for when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. 
for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. What is he saying here? He talks about you're, you're immature until you understand the life of righteousness by faith and not righteousness by works or disregarding God. You're immature. You're, you're still on milk until you understand this life of righteousness. Every now and then, I, I love to, to, to at least once a year, or maybe twice a year, teach a sermon on righteousness because it's such an important area of our lives that we just cannot allow Satan to come in and, and wreck it up. You've got to know when things are going good and when things are going bad, you've got to know I am the righteousness of God. Say that out loud. I am the righteousness of God. Now, let's go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 17. Romans 5 and verse 17. Ooh, I, I landed here just a few minutes ago. It, it was, I thought I was in Africa instead of Texas. It's like, dang. Romans 5, 17. He says, for if by one man's offense, verse 17, death reigned or ruled by one, much more they which received abundance of, of, of the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. And so you notice here that here's the gift, here, here's, the, here's the abundance of grace, and out of that abundance of grace, we see a gift, we see a gift of righteousness. The gift of righteousness comes from this abundance of grace. Now, it's been a very interesting three years. We, uh, my wife and I have, we have seen a lot. And we have seen God move in some, some miraculous ways. And it's, it's, it's added to our understanding of the grace of God and our definition. I, I used to just understand grace as favor, and it is favor, but it's so much more. I, I, I used to just look at grace as the unmerited favor, unearned favor. It is still all of that, but it is so much more. The grace of God is this unmerited provision. It's this, it's abounding provision, unmerited, abounding provision of the operation of the unrestrained, infinite love of God that comes through Jesus Christ for mankind, especially for those who depend on him. Let me say that again. It is the unmerited abounding provision. This grace is provision. It's the unmerited abounding provision of this, 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 this operation, this, this unrestrained operation of God's infinite love. In other words, there was a time where his, he, he loving us was restricted until Jesus did what he did on the cross. He's a God of justice. So, you know, the wages of sin was death. There are things that had to happen until Jesus got on the cross and, and did his thing and was raised from the dead and all that. But after he satisfied all of that, one of the things he did was he satisfied that justice. And so now, in the midst of your crazy, your crazy won't even restrain God's love. Glory to God. Your crazy will not restrain. His, his love is, not, is no longer restrained. It's no longer restricted anymore because of what Jesus has done. And so now he can love you and nothing about you can stop that love. It is his unrestrained, unrestricted, infinite love that, that, that works through Jesus Christ, that comes through Jesus Christ. It is for mankind, but it operates especially for those who depend on him. And I've learned to depend on him. When I was diagnosed with cancer, I learned to depend on him. When I was diagnosed with meningitis, I learned to 
depend on him. When, it, when, when all hell broke loose in, 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 in different situations, I learned to depend on him. Once you learn how to depend on God, you learn that that will cause more humility to come into your life. And you will submit to him because you know him. You talk to him and he talks to you and he gives you a peace that passes all understanding. You don't even understand why you are such at peace except the God you depend on keeps showing up in your life saying, I got you, I got you, I got you. And this gift of righteousness comes out of this grace and comes from this grace, who, by the way, is Jesus. Let's not ever go too far thinking that grace is a curriculum. It's Jesus. It's Jesus, praise God. Jesus, full of grace and truth. It's Jesus that we're celebrating. Every now and then I have these, I don't, I don't really know what they are, a group that comes and they pick it in front of the church because they're mad because we believe in Jesus. And, uh, you know, uh, I forget, I don't know who these guys are, but they come in and they say, well, you know, you know, we don't believe in Jesus, especially a white Jesus. And I just really got tired of it one day. And I said, look, dude, I don't care if he's white. I don't care if he's pink. I don't care if he's black, so black that he blue. All I care about is his blood took care of every situation that was going on in my life. Are you listening to me? The key word for this time right now is intimacy. Do you have an intimate relationship with God? It's got to go past head knowledge and it's got to be intimacy with Jesus Christ. I mean, there's some things that are happening right now. There's some things that are going on right now. Some of it you are aware of, some of it you are not aware of. But I'm telling you, when you have an intimate relationship with God, those that know their God, he will do exploits. Those that know their God, he will not leave you nor forsake you. Those that know their God, I don't care what systems fail in this earth, you're going to be all right. You're going to be just as good as those who were in Goshen. Praise God. No matter what happens in Egypt, in Goshen, you're going to have more than enough to do whatever God wants you to do. And you might as well learn how to praise him for it right now. Don't wait. Don't, don't wait until you need him before you try to get him. Go ahead and start walking with him every day of your life. Talk to him every day you get up. Let him, on the way home, talk to him. Have an intimate relationship with him where he can, he comes into you and see, and then he'll let you come into him and see. And that intimacy begins to develop. And in the midst of horrific situations, it's not bothering you because you know your God. Aren't you, aren't you tired of phoniness? Perfect the phoniness so much, we just, we don't even hardly know what's up. I, 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 I got to see Jesus face to face. And when I see him face to face, I, I, I don't want to say, who are you? I want to know him. You the one I, I walk with every morning. I, I got this thing where I'm doing, I'm doing these walks and I, I learned you can lose a lot of weight walking. I, I didn't think you could do that, but I, I, I can eat a lot and then go walking and it's gone off the next day. And so now I figure if I, I could walk, I can just eat whatever I want to eat. But, <laughs> but it's walking with God and allowing him to minister to me and, to, and for me to go to him and say, oh, oh Lord, and, and I cry a lot now because it, it, I can't hold it. He, he's just been so good. Have you ever sat back and count your blessings one by one? Have you ever looked at your life and realized where you could have been, where you should have been, where you might have ended up, and you realize it was the mighty hand of God that kept you out of all those situations? I believe I'm talking to somebody here tonight. God, God wants you to depend on him so he can show you his commitment to take care of you. And I believe that with all my heart. I guess I ought to get back to this sermon. Now look at verse 19. He says, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. By one man's disobedience, that would be Adam, many were made sinners. 
So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. That one would be Jesus Christ. All right, now, I'm going to just line up a couple of questions I want you to think, and I want you to look at what I'm asking you. What did you do to become a sinner? I mean, that's not a hard question. You, you know, we got simple questions that we make hard, like, what is a woman? <laughs> I, I apologize. I apologize. I'm, I'm just saying, that used to be an answer you could answer just like that. <laughs> now you pausing. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to be nice tonight. <laughs> What did you do to become a sinner? Well, you were just born, right? That situation was like there when you showed up. <laughs> I mean, what do you think? You, you, you see it while you're in your mother's womb? I mean, what, did you cuss your mama out while you were in the womb? Well, <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't do nothing. You were born into something. You were born into something that Adam was responsible for making, right? So you, you, you just you came into something that was already there. So what, what did you do to be made, what did you do to be, to be made righteous then? Again. What did you do to be made righteous? It was not because of any action of your own, but it was because of Jesus. Jesus did something, and you were born, you, 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 you showed up into something that had already been made ready. You showed up into something that was available because of Jesus. Glory to God. Quit trying to bring something to the table. You didn't bring anything to the table in the first place. Jesus brought it to the table, and you showed up, and everything was ready. The cornbread was cooked. The collard greens was ready. The potato salad was ready. It was all ready. Ham hocks was ready. All you had to do is sit down and come to the table. You didn't bring anything to the table. Look, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It, it's all right if I take my time, right? Yeah. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Familiar scriptures, but it's, it's something about getting this fresh in your mind and in your thinking that a lot of things will just line up when you understand who you are. Verse 21, he says, For he hath made him to be sin for us. All right, now think about it. Now, what did Jesus do to be, a, to, to be made sin? He never sinned. The Bible says he never sinned. And yet he was made sin. He who never sinned was made sin. Oh, my God. And then he says, uh, For he hath made, made him sin to, uh, for us who knew no sin, that we might be made, what? The righteousness of God in him. So he had never sinned and was made sin, and you ain't never been right, and it was made right with. Huh? So why are we righteous in God's eyes? Because, because we do right? No. You're not righteous. We're not righteous in God's eyes because we do right. It's because of Jesus that we're righteous. I am righteous because of Jesus. You got to understand something. As long as Jesus is all right, I'm all right. I'm righteous because of him. Let it settle. I'm righteous because of him. I'm righteous because of him. I'm righteous because of Jesus. I'm righteous because of Jesus. I'm going to say it two more times. I'm righteous because of Jesus. 
I am righteous because of Jesus. I didn't bring anything to the table. Look at this. Romans 5, let's look at this in the NLT. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. He says in verse 1, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. We now stand as born-again Christians, as the righteousness of God, we now stand in this place of undeserved privilege. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We are standing. You are the righteousness of God. If you're born again, say out loud, I'm the righteousness of God. Righteousness of God. As the righteousness of God because you believe what Jesus did. You had faith in Jesus Christ. And your faith laid hold and took possession of righteousness that Jesus has made available to you and has brought you to a place of undeserved privilege. Not brought you to a place that you deserve to be at that place. You are at this place, undeserved privilege. I am privileged to be the righteousness of God, privileged to be redeemed, privileged to have healing available to me, privileged to have wisdom available to me, not because I did something to boast about what I did to be in this place of privilege, but it is an undeserved place that is, I, God has brought me to this undeserved place, and I've got this undeserved privilege, praise God. So every time I declare I'm righteous, that I'm redeemed, that I have wisdom, that I have access to healing, access to prosperity, access to his promises, I don't dare do that without lifting my hands up and giving the credit and the glory where the glory is due. If it had not been for God, I wouldn't be in that place of undeserved privilege. Now, let's look at one, another scripture real quick. Romans 3 and 22. Romans 3 and 22. He says, we are made right with God. How? By placing our faith <laughs> in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. I'm made right with God because of my faith in Jesus Christ, period. I'm the righteousness of God because of my faith in Jesus Christ, period. Now, so how much right do you have to do to be righteous enough? How much good do you have to do before you're good enough? See, this is where some are. We have more faith in what we do for, 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 uh, for Jesus than what Jesus has already done for us. I said we have more faith in what we do for Jesus than having faith in what Jesus has already done for us. Most of the stuff you pray about is already done. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying? It, it, it's like you're going to God trying to get him to manufacture something that's already been manufactured. It's, it's in this dimension, finished. It's in this unseen dimension, finished. It just needs a path to move from this unseen, finished place to get to you, <laughs> manifest this style. It's not that it's not been done, it's just you can't see what has been done. So you're going to have to use your mouth and your imagination <laughs> 
to set up a path for what's already finished to show up done. And what the devil would do sometimes is try to get you to use your imagination and your mouth to, to provide a path for stuff in his arena to show up in your life. So don't tell me it don't work because as soon as you say something stupid, it seems like stupid show up. <laughs> it's not that it's not done. It's already done. It's already finished. It's already been provided. It's already been made. Some of y'all working hard to try to get your bag. Excuse me, I'm, 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 I'm in Texas. Some of you working hard to try to get your money. See, look at, look at all the white people. Like, what, what, I thought, what was a, what's a bag? <laughs> it's done. It's finished. Stop looking for more action and start putting your faith in what Jesus has already finished. It's finished. Hallelujah. Healing is already finished. You hear me? In each situation, cancer, whatever it was, my approach was not, oh, God, please heal me. My approach was, Father, I thank you that I'm already healed. I see it on me right now. What am I doing? I'm moving it from that, di that, that dimension to my physical place right now. I'm not trying to get him to do what he's already done. Do you know how frustrated you could be if I keep saying to you throughout the night, sit down. <laughs> Didn't you hear me? Sit down. Well, you already see it. What's the matter with him? Why do you keep telling us to sit down and we're already seated? Imagine heaven's doing the same thing. Oh, Lord, please heal me. He's like, D -d -d we did that. We did, we, we, we did that. Angel said, 2,000 years ago, it's been done. I don't know what they're talking about. It's already done. See, th this is going to change your perspective of how you're, it's, it's done. That goes, well, how come I'm having so many problems? Now, listen to me on this now. We must mature. We must, mat we must mature into our call. We must mature into that place that God has for us. We must mature into that plan. Quit being afraid of pressure. Stop being afraid of, afraid of trouble. Because you can use trouble to help you mature to that position where you are not presently. So if trouble comes, that ought to be shouting ground that something getting ready to happen. And rather than you running from it and and, 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 oh, Lord, I don't understand Jesus. I don't understand why this happening to me. I just don't see why. why this, stop it. We've got to mature. The immaturity level in the body of Christ is at an all-time low. We complain about everything. We act almost like the world. It's all about us. It's about me. And we've got to mature. We, listen. One of the things I do every morning when I pray and doing my walks, one of the things I do is I have a space to pray for my enemies. I pray for people who I know don't like me because it's them not liking me that's helping me to mature to a place where that doesn't cause me to act like a wicked sinner and want to get back at you, I've already matured in an automatic place of saying, Lord, bless them today. Whatever's going on in their lives, Lord, help them out here. Help them out there. It takes maturity to do that. Now, now you remember when you were immature, you want to cut a joker. <laughs> but that's immaturity. We've got to mature to that place where God is calling us, that place where you are anointed, that place where you are appointed, and don't run from the trouble. 
look at the trouble and say, you want some of me. You want some of me. Bring it home. You want, you want some of me. I will me argue you down. I, I'm not scared of you. And you got to, listen. <clears throat> the Lord said to me, uh, oh, two and a half years ago, he says, if you can completely be free from people, I can use you in unusual ways. You're trying to set people free, and you're not going to do it until you get free from them. The worst bondage you can ever have is people bondage. I, I went through a, uh, a situation where, to be honest with you, I was almost out of here. And I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me, and, and there are things that happen I can't even articulate. And, and a lot of people don't know a, a, a lot of things, but, you know, I just like, you know, okay. And God says, you're ready now. I said, why, why am I ready now? And I went, after 41 years, I'm ready now? Why now? He says, because you're not concerned about what people think and say about you. And he told me, he says, I'm going to use you to stir some stuff up, but you got to be free from people. And I am telling you in the name of Jesus, I love people, but I can't tell you how much I don't care what they say and how they say it. I don't. I, I ain't got time for that. As long as I got Taffy L. Dollar and my children and grandbabies and all of us and people that are in my life, your life is a sum total of who you have in it. It ain't a sum total of those people who don't pay your bills who don't give you nothing to eat, who don't hug you and love you and take care of you. Some of you can mature a lot better if you can get delivered from people, but you're so in bondage to people, you can't hardly put nothing on me in your closet and wear it because you're so concerned about what the ladies in the church going to think about this when I wear it. Instead of saying, I don't care what they think about this. I bought this dress. I wear what I want to wear. If they don't like it, so be it. We got to be delivered from people so we can deliver people. What the people going to think? What the people going to think? What the people going to think? And I tell you what, I am completely satisfied with understanding that my maturity, I can mature if trouble comes. Bring it on. I'm just going to get better. I will not come out of a trial without wisdom. Don't you dare go through trouble and not come out with some wisdom. Amen? Amen. You, 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 you've been preparing all your Christian life for this season that is upon us. All your Christian life, you've been preparing for this. And now it's here. So it's not a game anymore. It's not play church anymore. We have closed the circus down and put out all the clowns out of the church. It's not, it's not playing church anymore. This stuff is real. And you need to know your God. Let me, let me get back up here. So, no more afraid of trouble. No more afraid of pain. We have faith and what Jesus has already done. You're familiar in your past teachings. Righteousness is your stance and your position with God. That's your stance and position with God. It's your ability to be able to stand in the presence of our Father as if you never sinned. That sin never existed because you're standing right in, the, in His presence. It's the ability to stand in, 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 the sense, in, in the presence of our Father without any sense of fear. Standing in the presence of the Father with no sense of fear, no sense of guilt, no sense of shame, no sense of inferiority. This is what this righteousness will do. I can stand in the presence of God. I am the righteousness of God, no sense of guilt. I am the righteousness of God, no sense of inferiority, no sense of shame. No sense of condemnation. And these are the things that the enemy will try to use to try to bring you down mentally 
and that stuff gets on the inside of you and you forgot what, what, uh, what John 3.16 says, you, you have, this is the time to pass these tests. This is the time for you to know your God and allow him to mature you and use everything necessary to get you ready because it's game time now. It's game time, y'all. And I'm going to tell you something. We're going we to whoop some devil, but it is game time. Listen, here, here is something that's something else that's already done. Our victory is already done. No, 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 no. You're not trying to get victory. You, you, you're, not, you're not trying to get you. Oh, well, I came here to get me some victory. No, you, you ain't, you're not trying to get victory. Jesus got it for you. Victory is already done. You're not moving from, from, from failure to victory. You're moving from victory by faith to victory to some more victory. You're moving from victory to victory. It's victory is finished. Your victory is a, is a finished deal. Praise God. Your victory over the job situation, your victory over your finances, your victory over sickness and disease, your victory over your enemies, your victory is already done. Quit trying to get victory and go ahead and receive victory that has already been finished. This is what our faith is all about. This is what our faith is all about. Amen. Now, go to Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans 10, verse 3. Well, I'm just a preacher. What do I know? <laughs> Romans 10, verse 3 through 4. Four. I want to read this out of here. Hold on a minute. <clears throat> he says, verse 3, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, not knowing about God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. You know, I heard something the other day. You know, you have to really study to keep up with how this generation, how to even talk. My younger daughter was talking to me and I had no idea what she said. <laughs> but I heard a phrase, I, and you may, you may be familiar with this. She says, you know, she said like, my truth. And then I, I, and, and I thought, okay, so the truth now has been divvied up and everybody got their own separate truth. And I'm trying to figure out how does that work? All right, if you got your truth and you got your truth and you got your truth. And, and what I noticed was they were all, they were, most of the time they were saying my truth. In other words, I'm doing something you don't like and you don't agree with. And then they say, well, that's my truth. No, you're gonna kill yourself if you keep doing that. What do you mean that's your truth? Then I, had a, I heard another team that said, uh, they, they were laughing around and, and, and they said, I'm dying. In fact, it was my grandson that said that, right? He, he said, what? Uh, yeah, he said, I'm dead. Ha, 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 I'm dead. I said, what? <laughs> he said, ha, 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 I'm dead. I said, boy, don't say that. What's the matter with you? You can't be, ha, ha, ha I'm dead. You keep, ha, 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 I'm dead. You don't be dead. Come on, don't be saying you dead. <laughs> he go, oh, Papa, ain't nothing wrong with that. It's just a saying. N it ain't nothing... See, that's, what, that's, the, that's the devil's trick, is to, to, to belittle it, make it seem like it ain't nothing. And I, I'm like, what? Well, well. So it, it's establishing their own righteousness. This is my truth. Well, what, ha, ha, have you ever been exposed to the truth? Well, what is the truth? The truth is God and his word. No, thank you. I have my truth. No, you have an excuse. That's not your truth. That is an excuse for you to be able to do what you want to do, trying to feel all right about it. Woo. After a while, I was just like, ooh, keep the grandkids out of the house for a minute. I just... 
I, I thought about that. <laughs> I'm dead. What? I mean, think about that. That's the, that's the crazy, demonic influence that's on this generation right now. That everything is a joke. And, 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 and you try to talk to them, and, and I go to phone right here. Hey, so how was your day? Oh, it was good. Did you hear what I just said? Yeah, I heard everything you just said. What you doing? Nothing. And I'm thinking, if this was a cliff, you would fall. Because you're not paying attention to things. They go about and establish their own righteousness. The norms and values of society basically says, if you get some people to agree with you on this, then they'll try to turn it into a norm and then make it a value and then one, night, one day, somebody say, that's the truth. That's not how that works. For ladies and gentlemen, I declare unto you this day that there's about to be a mighty tsunami of God's glory to hit this world. And people are going to wake up wanting Jesus in their life. See, you think, you think that certain people won't change without you. But God can change people without you, honey. God can wake people up and make them so hungry for him that they'll give their life to Jesus. And there's about to be some supernatural conversions to take place in your life, to take place in your family, to take place on your job. God is getting ready to show out and show you that he is still the almighty God. Nobody saves like God. Nobody delivers like God. And the only thing you're going to have left to say is this is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our sight. So they're being ignorant of God's righteousness. And they're going about establishing their own righteousness. And they have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Your position in righteousness is going to be a big key in this season. Your position in righteousness will determine how effective you will be in living the victorious life of faith and taking possession of the grace of God in your life. Why? Because the root of our behavior is our identity. And when we know that we're the righteousness of God, the day you believe that, you're going to do right. We're so concerned about what you do, and we keep bypassing what you believe and how you believe. You believe right, you're going to start doing right. You believe right, things are going to line up right. You believe right, God is going to deposit wisdom and show you what to do when you don't know what to do. But it all starts in that place. I believe what Jesus has done. Your position of righteousness is going to be your place of power. Your position of righteousness will determine your position of power and it will determine your position of results. Something this simple to understand that I am indeed the righteousness of God is going to determine a whole lot of things and how things go in this season where you're concerned. But not when, not when everything is looking awesome and everybody's jumping and shouting in church, but you've got to be able to accomplish this when the pressure is on. When the pressure is on, you might have some tears coming out your eyes. I'm the righteousness of God. You might feel like you, you're hurting. I'm the righteousness of God. I mean, you may have had some, some just real egregious things happen in your life. I am the righteousness of God. Say that, I am the righteousness of God. When you become established in righteousness, righteousness acts like a magnet. And you know what happens? It will attract blessings into your life. This is key. Sometimes, you know, we, we cannot allow this particular gift to be belittled to the point where we let it slip and we don't remind ourselves first and foremost of who we are. I 
have been made righteous. I'm the righteousness of God. Don't ever, 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 ever let that go. That is a mighty, mighty key in what we're doing. So we got to believe that you are the righteousness of God and you will attract healing. Believe you're the righteousness of God, you will attract deliverance. It's already finished. You believe you're the righteousness of God, be that magnet on the other side and bring it in from that dimension to where you are right now. So this is so very important. As we begin to walk through this, you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going really detailed on this one because self-righteousness is, is going to be it's going to be interesting because a lot of us can look at areas in our life where we are self-righteous. But I want you to understand, even when you discover self-righteousness in your life, say, I am the righteousness of God because I believe in Jesus Christ. Amen? Okay, let's get into this. Somebody said, I thought we already into it. No, nah, bro, I'm just trying to figure y'all out, see where y'all at. <laughs> when, if you thought I started preaching? I ain't started preaching yet. <laughs> no. Uh, some of y'all ready to put that finger up. Well, I got to go now. I don't know how long you, you stay here all night long. I got to go now. <laughs> Romans chapter four. Romans chapter four, verses one through eight. All right, now, now check this out. Follow me carefully. Abraham was, well, Abraham was humanly speaking, the founder of our Jewish nation. What did he discover about being made right with God? If his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about if his good deed made him acceptable for God. He would have something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. When people work, their wages are not a gift, but something they earned. But people are counted as righteous, not because of their work, but because of their faith in God who forgives sinners. David also spoke of this when he described the happiness of those who are declared righteous without working for it. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of. Now, notice in verse 1 the question, what did he discover about being made right? He said, well, if his good deeds had been, had been, had been acceptable to God, he would have something to boast about, but that was not God's way. So if the blessing of God is a reward for good behavior, then we get the credit for it. If the blessings of God is a reward for good behavior, then we get the credit for earning it. However, if the blessing is a gift, then Jesus gets the credit. We believe that this righteousness is a gift and Jesus gets the credit. <laughs> we, don't, we don't believe that it's a reward for our good work or our good behavior. <laughs> you know, I, I am the righteousness of God because of my good behavior. No, I am, a, I, I, I am the righteousness of God because this is a gift that Jesus gave me, and I give him credit for me being righteous. And again, the day you believe this is the day your behavior is going to line up with it. But what we do is we put so much attention on our behavior and not our identity. And so what happens is when you do bad, then you say to yourself, I'm a bad boy. But you've got to understand, I am the righteousness of God. And something crazy happened. I'm still the righteousness of God. You know, that's, that's going to be straightened up because you are working on that identity and receiving that gift of righteousness, and that is going to determine your behavior. A lot of people are 
They struggle with their behavior because they don't know who they are. Once you know who you are, then that, that, that begins to fall in place and you begin to see what you need to do. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 34. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34. Verse 34 says this, think carefully about what is right or awake to righteousness. Think carefully what is right and stop sinning. Awake to righteousness and sin no more. He says, for to your shame, I say that some of you don't know God at all. Awake to righteousness and sin no more. I believe this is the time for us to really wake up to what this is all about huge, huge. It's, it's always the things that seem to be small and insignificant. Oh, I've learned that, so I'm good. I can go on. This is not something you can walk from and expect for things to be okay. We got to get this and we got to keep this and it cannot slip. Galatians chapter 216 in the NLT. Galatians chapter 216. <clears throat> I think I'll have time to, to at least give a definition of self-righteousness. No, you don't never want me to take my time. <laughs> Verse 16, he says, Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. He is saying it's your faith in the one that's responsible for the gift. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that's responsible for the gift. Now, uh, I got a, uh, uh, some minutes left. Now, let's move to self-righteousness. I think you're pretty clear on this righteousness because you're going to have to make a choice. You're going to have to choose between the righteousness of God or you're going to have to lean on over to self-righteousness. Now, the first thing I want to do is define self-righteousness. It's very simply this. Self-righteousness is when you are striving, people striving to get right with God. You're working and sweating to get right with God. Instead of receiving the gift, you're striving to get what the gift is. That's self-righteousness. And look at Galatians 5 and 4. Striving and working. Striving, people striving to get right with God. And oh, you ought to see some of the things people are doing to strive to get right with God. Galatians 5 verse 4. For if you are trying to make yourself right with God by keeping the law, you have been cut off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. See, you fall away from God's grace when you're striving to try to get something through your own performance. That's how you fall from grace. Somebody says, well, this person sinned, they fell from grace. No, that's not falling from grace. You don't fall. See, when, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you miss the mark, Grace is there to help you out. You fall from grace when you're striving and performing to try to deserve something. <laughs> and you're working really, really hard, striving to be right. I'm going to be right with God. Hallelujah, I'm going to be oh, right with God. <laughs> and somebody come and take your parking space, you'll cuss them out in a minute trying to be right with God. <laughs> Now, on the same level with self-righteousness is bad religion. Religion, religion is the same thing as self-righteousness. It's man's pursuit to make his, his self right before God. Man pursuit to try to make himself right with God. I tell you what, I, I came up in the uh, African Methodist Episcopal Church and then I moved to the Baptist church. And man, that stuff almost told me, I mean, it was just like, I mean, 
Cologne was like lust in a bottle. <laughs> you, you couldn't do nothing. <laughs> it, it was self-righteousness. Here's this, here's, here's this person, self-righteousness is like, well, you know, I, um, I don't cuss. I don't smoke. I don't drink brass monkey. Yeah, but you're tearing that tequila up, ain't you? No. <laughs> I don't watch R-rated movies. I don't even look at my naked body when I get out of the shower. <laughs> you know why? Because I am holy and you are not. I'm holy. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, you might not look at yourself when you get out of the shower, but you're self-righteous. And self-righteousness is unrighteousness. And we got to get over that. It causes us to look down at people rather than bearing them up. A self-righteous person, we just, we, we, we're, we think we got it together in our own, you know, our own ability. And that's not, that's not how that works. And then striving so hard. You know, we used to have fish fries on in my, my Methodist church. We had, you, you come in, you get fish fries and, and a fish sandwich and, and uh, hot dogs for $2. What you going to build for $2? And I'm like, working real hard. My, my grandmother was one of those, she, she, she would get in the church and the preacher would acknowledge everybody who worked that Saturday. I appreciate sister so-and-so, thank you. You know, thank you for the, bringing the bread. Appreciate sister so-and-so. The fish was delicious. <laughs> and boy, if you forget to call my, my grandmama's name. Her name was Maddie Dollar. I called her my mammon. And, um, she, she needed to have some, she needed to have, she needed to have some congratulations because she was a, she was a, she was a little self-righteous. My mom was a little self-righteous. You know, I did this, I did that, I did this, you didn't do this. And, and I love her, but I was a big part of her vocabulary. And you could probably identify some self-righteousness in your life if I is a big part of your vocabulary. And so we need to deal with this so we can get ourselves away from it. You, you remember in, in Luke 18, we'll talk about this a little later, where the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector, and this dude, in fact, let's look at it right now. We got a little time. Look at it right now. Somebody said, I thought we were getting ready to go. Go. <laughs> Luke 18. Luke 18, 9. This is the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and they scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God that I am not a sinner like everyone else. For I don't cheat and I don't sin and I don't commit adultery. I am certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Ladies and gentlemen, religion operates through guilt and fear. Self-righteousness operates through guilt and fear. It is dependency on guilt. That is what keeps 
it, it keeps religion alive. It, it keeps religion well. It's like a drug dealer giving an addict a small dose of drugs to keep him coming back for more. And that's hap that happens with religion, and that happens in the area of self-righteousness. Dependency on guilt. It is dependency on how I can make you feel shame. And that's got to that's stop. I'm doing everything I can to just drive it out. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's got to stop. Guilt is not something that we should be walking in. Because if you allow guilt to stay in your life, self-condemnation is going to come. And when a person condemns himself because of guilty feelings, he's also opening the door for a lot of other emotional problems like uh, inferiority, uh, loneliness, anxiety. All these things come because you're walking around guilty all the time. And I know it's something, well, yeah, I don't think we'll deal with that in church, but we need to deal with it in church because there's, there's a lot of guilty people walking around and you got, you, you, God has, listen, God does not want you walking around in, in guilt and in shame. He said, he that believeth on me, he said, will not be put to shame. I mean, you believing on him and believing you're the righteousness of God, Satan will use guilt until he tries to kill you. Another thing that happens when you allow guilt to stay in your life this person usually feels that he's merely getting what he deserves for being so bad. You allow guilt to, guilt to stay there long enough, I just feel like I'm getting what I deserve. I'm just, so, I'm just such a bad person. That's not what we need to be rehearsing right now. That's not what we need to be declaring right now. We need to be declaring how, how we're, we've been made right because of Christ Jesus, that our faith in Jesus has made us the righteousness of God. Here's another thing that guilt will do if you don't get rid of it and deal with it. You'll start placing blame on other people for your problem and for your wrong. You'll start playing the blame game. And that's not cool because when you start playing the blame game, that means you are not accepting responsibility for the part that you played in that situation. You got to get rid of the guilt. How do I get rid of it? I'm going to believe in Jesus. I'm going to believe I'm the righteousness of God. I am not going to live my life as a Christian, show up at Christian events, come to church, and, and always walking around guilty. And then when somebody says, how you doing? Oh, praise the Lord. You got to stop all that, man. You got to get rid of that guilt, man. Here's, a, here's, another, here's another thing. Here's another thing. The, pessimism can come as a result of you maintaining that guilt. You're just negative. You got a negative outlook on life. You don't do that around maybe your, your brothers and sisters in the Lord, but like I said, you'll get around other people and family members and you'll be just, just, a, just a huge pessimist. It's just so easy to come around other Christians and just look and just smile and cheese real big, and, that, and that's good. Maybe you're working your faith out. But you still don't need to allow guilt to be the little roach that crawls around in your soul and torments you. And that's what... That's what self-righteousness and religion will do. That's why they are so much alike. We have to understand who we are in Christ Jesus. We are the righteousness of God. We are, we are created in his image. And we can do whatever he says we can do. And we can have whatever he says we can have. And now is the time for you to lay hold of your identity your righteousness in Christ and prepare yourself for all that is to come. Prepare yourself for the victory that has already been given. You haven't been doing all of this just to lose. Your victory is at hand. Put it on, wear it, walk in it. All is well with you and your house. Amen. I'm done. God bless you. together for Pastor Creflo Dollar. Wow. Did you enjoy that tonight? I said, did you enjoy that tonight? Are you filled up? Nobody. Are you filled up? Are you in overflow? Awesome. We have day three tomorrow.
Uh, doors open up at 8 o'clock. Prayer everywhere with Pastor Terry. For all of you that are watching from all over the world, still over 25,000 of you are joining us right now. And we're so grateful to have each one of you joining us. Thank you for being a part. Tomorrow morning, you don't want to miss uh, Prayer Everywhere with Pastor Terry at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. And, of course, 9.30 Eastern, wherever that is, wherever, if you're in Nigeria, the Nigerians are watching us, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, you guys are watching us from all the world. Welcome. We're so glad that you've joined us tonight. Join us tomorrow morning. And, of course, it's going to be a great power Pack day again. And so, again, we want to let you know that God loves you, we love you, and let's everyone know Jesus is Lord. God bless.